You know, it seems that um, <clears throat> we, are, we are all on different tracks. We're, we're all at different places, spiritually speaking. Some of us have really developed spiritually. Others of us have not even gone through spiritual puberty. That doesn't make us bad. It just means that we're not all at the same place. But the thing that excites me about today's sermon is that I know that some of you are, are going to bloom today. Some of you are all of a sudden going to realize just exactly what it is that you need to be doing. So I want you to open up your Bibles and turn with me to a story out of the book of Mark in the 10th chapter, Mark chapter 10, and we're going to start in verse 17. And it says this, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Now, I want to give you some background on the rich young ruler. So in your sermon notes, I want you to put two words up on there in that little uh, box that I've given you, these two little columns. Left side, put the word wealthy. And right next to that, put the word options because this guy, when he came to Jesus, he had all kinds of options in his life. Wealth allows you to have options in your life. When the lottery was $1.7 billion, we were all thinking about the options that we could be afforded with $1.7 billion. Wealth allows that. See, he had freedom. He could do what he wanted. He could do it when he wanted. He was self-sufficient because wealth brings Options. Now, what he does with his wealth can be a blessing to God or it can be a detriment to the kingdom. There's nothing wrong with possessions or, or wealth. We all have them. The issue is not do you have possessions. The issue is do possessions have you? I have known people with very few things in life, but the few things they had totally controlled their life. And sometimes we're, we're like the little fly on the flypaper who says, I like it so much here, I think I'll stay. And in this story, it's not the man having possessions. It is the fact that his possessions have him. So beside the words good moral, moral character, or excuse me, I didn't put that up there. Put the word nice guy. Is that the next one? Yep, there you go. Then you got ruler. Put that one. Influence. There you go. Put the word ruler. Put the word influence. See, he has a lot of respect, a lot of esteem, a lot of privilege. When, when you look at this guy's life, he's influenced a lot of people. He's a ruler. Now, beside the words good moral character, put the words nice guy. He was a nice guy. He was the kind of guy that you would want to have for your neighbor or want to have as a friend. He, he kept all of the commandments with his fellow man. Now, beside the word young put the word time his future is bright he's just starting out he's got all of these options in his life and he influences by by what he says and and what he does and where he goes he is very well respected by those around him and there's a few things though that you should notice out of this story for starters he has a level of courage that is different than most he was a ruler and the rulers of that day were doing their best, plotting against Jesus to bring him down. 
And the most uh, of the other rulers, they would be going off and meeting in, in secret meetings and trying to figure out how it was they could stop Jesus in his ministry. So most of the rulers didn't come near Jesus. And if they did come near Jesus, they were trying to trip him up with some kind of a, a trick question. But this rich young ruler has sincere questions. He's not even like Nicodemus sneaking around at night. He comes to Jesus and it's in broad daylight. He is seeking out answers. It was rather spontaneous. Look again at verse 17 in the text. It says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him. Jesus is starting to head on his way and this guy runs up to him. You did not see rulers of that day running. People ran to the rulers. But rulers didn't really run after anybody. And this guy is sincerely seeking spiritual fulfillment. But he also shows a measure of humility because he kneels before Jesus. Look what it says again. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Again, you don't see rulers running. And you definitely didn't see rulers kneeling. But not this guy. He wants answers so bad that he is willing to take a lower seat to get it. And he's very open with Jesus. He's, he's genuine and real and transparent. And you just didn't see rulers doing this, running and kneeling. The rulers were the ones with all of the answers. But this guy is filled with questions that he asks of Jesus. Let me just be honest with you for a second. If you come to church and, and you're just putting on a show... And if you aren't open and transparent and willing to take a risk when you come to worship, you need to understand something about Jesus because Jesus looks past our exterior. He looks beyond our face and our clothing and he goes right to our heart. Something I know to be true as a pastor is that people can look very nice on a Sunday morning. But I know beyond the nice Sunday clothes and the groomed hair and all of the smiles, I know that we can sure cover up an awful lot. And my prayer is that Jesus would, would be here in our midst and look past all of that. And when Jesus looked at the rich young ruler, he looked past the clothing and he saw that there were some things that were out of place in his life. Write this down. There was a spiritual frustration that Jesus saw in this man. This man was spiritually frustrated. He, he saw this in the man's face. Jesus told him, verse 20, 21, one thing you lack. Is that not an interesting phrase? You see, the ruler didn't come to Jesus out of a sense of guilt. He never really knew guilt. He didn't come to Jesus because he knew that he was guilty and he needed a savior. This man was self-sufficient. He had everything together. This guy has all the answers. And when he came running to Jesus, he didn't come because he had some kind of a sense of, of guilt in his life. In fact, he thought he was a pretty good guy. In fact, when he came to Jesus, he said, I'm such a good guy. I can't even imagine what it is that's wrong with me. So what is the problem? He was spiritually frustrated. Not, not guilty, not convicted, frustrated. Have you ever been in that place? Have you tried to do the best you can do only to feel like there's something deep down inside that, that needs something more? You can't quite put your finger on it. It's like there's some emptiness or some darkness. I don't know. I can't figure it out. That was this guy. He does all the right stuff, but there is still something missing in his life. And he's spiritually frustrated, but also he's spiritually immature. He hasn't gone through spiritual puberty. He knows all the right answers to the spiritual quiz. I mean, Jesus tells him all the commandments and he says, I've kept all those. Let's think about that, shall we? So never one time, not even once, has he told a lie. He's never looked at a woman with lust. He's never even stolen anything, no matter how small or, or how big. Probably where Jesus zeroes in on with him is the very first commandment. You see, 
it se seems that he's doing okay with keeping the laws that are related to his fellow man, apparently, but God is definitely not first in his life. And when God is not first, folks, there is spiritual frustration. You show me a Christian who does not submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and give him absolutely everything in their life, and I will show you a Christian that is constantly frustrated and spiritually immature. Also, he's spiritually independent. This is the worst part about this guy. You can tell that he's independent because when he comes to Jesus, he asks the question, what shall I do? That is the wrong question. But that is the question that all of us like to ask. We, we like to be in charge. We like to be in control. But the question is not, what shall I do? The question is, what shall I be? Too many of us are trying to do things that we aren't. You see, Jesus wants us to be totally his. He wants us to be totally consecrated to him. For Jesus, spiritual fulfillment comes from being spiritually dependent on him. Right before this episode with the rich young ruler, Jesus was, was blessing little children. And, and he said, you have to be like these little kids to go to heaven. Jesus' point is that you have to be completely dependent on him. That's where the rich young ruler's frustration lay. Up until that day, he thought that he could make it without God. And some of you might feel the same way, that you don't really need God. You don't need miracles in your life. You've, you've done this for so long. You don't need him, or so you think. The thing God cannot handle in me and in you is independence. But look at how Jesus deals with this man. Verse 21, it says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. And before I go on, I want to underscore this Phrase, I want you to know that Jesus will totally transform your life. He will take all of the stuff out of your life that needs to be taken out because he loves us. He doesn't do it out of legalism. He doesn't do it because he's God and he can make you do what he wants. Jesus loved this man. And he wanted to, him to, to get out of the spiritual rut that he was in. So look what Jesus said in Mark 10, 21. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Jesus told him to, to go and sell everything and, and to come and follow him. And I really don't think the rich young ruler heard that come and follow me part at all. Because when he heard the words go and sell, there was this mental block that, that just came over him. Why did Jesus tell him to do that? I don't, I don't really know. Other than probably Jesus knew that his possessions controlled him. Jesus probably realized that this young man could not serve two masters. So he either had to get his possessions under control or he needed to get rid of his possessions. You see, there are three levels of control. Write these down. Number one, the top level is where God controls my possessions and me. In other words, God has ownership of both of them, my possessions and me. Now, if he owns me, and everything that I have, then, then we're in good shape because anything he wants, he gets. No problems, no fights, no wrestling with God. Then there is the middle level where I control my possessions. God has nothing to do with it. This is, this is the businessman. This is the guy who learns to make his possessions multiply for himself. We admire his discipline. We admire that he has the ability to control, at least what he thinks, what he has. And then there is the bottom level where our possessions control us. This is the level where there is big trouble. And this is where the rich young ruler was. 
And the Lord knew this, and Jesus wanted him to make changes in his life. Now, now notice the reaction to what Jesus said. Verse 22, it says, At this, the man's face fell. He went away, sad, because he had great wealth. This young man went away, sad, but he wasn't the only one sad. Jesus was sad as well. Jesus was sad because he saw what this young man could be. Look at how the disciples reacted to this entire incident. Verse 23 continues. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said it again. Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Needles in Jesus' day were like needles in our day. Just to help you out. You see, the disciples, they were like you. They, they were like me. They, they grew up thinking that the blessings of God are a sign of God's approval over your life. So in their mind, a, a rich man who is blessed by God is, is more blessed than a poor man, and he's closer to God than a poor man because he has more stuff, and God has obviously blessed him. Now listen, because this is the takeaway from this story for, for you, and I want you to not miss this. I want you to write this down. It is not what you collect but what you commit that opens the doors to God's blessings on your life. So, so what about you? What about your reaction? I, I think that if you, if you turned everything over to God, then, then you read this story and, and you're rooting for the rich young ruler. You're, you're saying, man, just go ahead. Just do it. Go home. Sell it all. Get rid of it. It's easy, man. Go back and follow Jesus after you do it. Give up all your stuff. But if you have not given everything over to God, then you kind of feel sorry for the rich young ruler. And you, you might think Jesus is a little hard on this guy. So three observations as we close out this whole story. Number one, realize that it is impossible to find spiritual fulfillment in possessions. The clearest part of this story is that we see that this man had all of these possessions and he walks away sad. You cannot find fulfillment in things in this world. He who dies with the most toys is dead. Secondly, only Jesus can give you spiritual fulfillment. It's really that simple. You either come face to face with the fact that you can bring Jesus the issues of life and you can give Jesus everything or you can hold back and you can walk away Kind of sad. It's your choice. All spiritual fulfillment is centered on Jesus. And a lot of you, frankly, haven't even figured that out yet. You, you've never truly been satisfied in your faith. And that is the reason why. Finally. <coughs> if you want spiritual ful fulfillment, give everything to God. Just turn it all over to him. Everything. You need to understand something about God. God will not flow through you or in you and for you until you give everything over to him. Because then you're like a child. You no longer are in control. So what about you? What are you holding back? What is it that you quite have not let go of yet? A relationship, your finances, are you, are you holding back a little bit of your heart, a secret sin, truthfulness? What are you holding back that you have not given God complete reign over in your life? I've often wondered about the rich young ruler when he walks away sad from Jesus. What happened to that guy? 
Wouldn't it be neat to think if he was, he was the guy that is introduced later as Barnabas in the book of Acts who sells a large piece of land and he lays it at the disciples' feet? Wouldn't that be neat? We don't know. The story is left open-ended. Maybe that's because the story is still unfolding for us today. How will you leave the presence of Jesus Christ today? Will you be glad because you have actually given everything over to God? You have not held anything back. You've just kind of laid it all out and you've said, God, here's all of it. My car, my house, my my finances, all of it is yours, God. And if there is stuff in here that you know I need to have taken out of my life, God, then I want you to take it out of my life because I don't want anything to come in between me and you. I want you to have unfettered access. So there it is. Have you done that with your whole life? So here is your assignment. I want you to leave today and I want you to genuinely do an assessment of your life. What is it that you could be potentially holding back from Jesus? Is there something that you have been reluctant to let him have? It might not be money. But I would bet a fair shake money is a lot of it for a lot of you. You will never find fulfillment until you are willing to give absolutely everything over to Jesus.